public hint that Commodore was working on a new successor to the Commodore 64 was in a 1989 issue of Compute's Gazette. Here they talk a little bit about how Apple had come out with the 2GS a few years earlier and wondered if Commodore might have something similar. The latest rumor says yes, we've heard reports from several sources of a new machine from Commodore, a 64GS if you will. And then they went on to talk about the rumored hardware capabilities. Apparently not everyone at Commodore was on board, with the engineers calling this the son of a plus four. Nevertheless, Nintendo and other gaming consoles had eaten a big hole in Commodore's market and the 64 was not selling anywhere near the volume that it used to. The Amiga had never really taken hold of the market the way the 64 did during its heyday. And so I think they were looking for something low cost to replace the C64. So let's take a look at the Commodore timeline a bit to see where this slots in exactly. Uh, Commodore had quite a few products here and I'm not even showing all of the variations or the PC clones, but I think it's important to also realize that this timeline shows the time of introduction. But keep in mind the C64 was still being sold. Uh, the first four years was the bread bin and then the 64C continued to be sold until Commodore's ultimate demise in 1994. So apparently this new project was being developed around 1990. And the thing is, there's no doubt about it, it would have directly competed with the Amiga 500, most likely stealing sales away from that, as well as the 600, which was probably already on the drawing board by this time, uh, maybe even the CDTV, as all of these were meant to be low cost computers for consumers. So that's my guess as the most probable reason the product was never finished. Nevertheless, I have a Commodore 65 prototype here, and it's amazing how close to production it appears to have been. Now, most collectors believe there are less than 200 of these in existence, and probably even less than that, which are actually functional. Every now and then, one of these will come up for sale on eBay, and they usually sell for between twenty dollars and $80,000. Uh, this particular machine comes from Bo Zimmerman's collection. I picked it up for him last time I was driving through Austin, and I'll be returning it after I finish this video. I wanted to start off by talking a bit about the exterior design language. I mean, here it is compared to a 64C. You can definitely see it shares a lot in common with this, and perhaps even more so with the 128. However, notice there are no ports on the right side, most likely because the disk drive mechanism is in the way. The keyboard sits slightly lower than the 64C, and the keys themselves are also lower profile, more similar to what's on the 128 actually. On the left side, you'll find the typical joystick ports, power switch, reset, and power input. And here's the rear with most of the ports, but we'll circle back to these in a moment. First, I want to talk a little bit more about the power port. Like the C64, it is a DIN style connector, but it's not actually the same layout. It turns out it uses the same power brick as the 1581 disk drive. So yeah, uh, for the 1581 and 1541 too, Commodore used an external power brick, and so that's what the C65 came with. Speaking of disk drives, um, I also have here the companion disk drive known as the 1565. The color is slightly less yellow, which suggests Bose C65 may have yellowed a bit over the years. This is a cute little disk drive. Um, there are a few things I'd like to point out. Now, first of all, look at the uh, power port. It's the same power port as the computer. In fact, this is the power brick I got with the drive. Uh, notice it says it works with the 1541 2, 1571 2, and 1581. Except, uh, I've never heard of a 1571-2. Sounds like Commodore was planning to make a 1571 drive with an external power brick at some point. I should also mention the badge here. Um, apparently no C65 units had a badge. But Bo installed a custom badge on his, which has the typical Commodore design language. But uh, there's no guarantee the badge would have looked like this. Okay, now let's talk about these rear ports. Um, let's start by talking about this tiny little disk drive port. So it's not the standard Commodore IEC port. In fact, uh, here's the cable that was supplied. It looks kind of like an off-the-shelf mini-DIN cable. However, it does have a cable label on it, which says CBM1521, and then it's 10 feet. So uh, anyway, that just plugs in here. So on the back of the drive, it's pretty obvious they originally had a larger port here, probably a regular-sized DIN. But I can't quite tell if this plastic was filled after the fact, or if this was just a quick and dirty change to the plastic mold, and thus manufactured this way. Anyway, our cable connects up here like so. Well, what if you wanted to use a standard Commodore IEC drive? Well, it has a port for that way over here. And just like previous systems, it's simply labeled as serial. And so you can plug your regular disk drives in like so. Now, it's worth pointing out that the internal drive is always drive 8. And if you have the external drive, then it is drive 9. And then if you have any IEC disk drives, those have to be configured as drive 10 or above. We'll circle back around to this later as we need to talk more about this. 
But for the moment, back to our ports discussion. So uh, this little section here is audio video, and you do get a standard Commodore DIN style video connector. Uh, this is the same kind used on the C64, Plus 4, and VIC-20, and it just breaks out into the usual RCA style connectors. Oddly enough, it still includes an RF modulator. I'm sort of surprised for a more high-end product like this. Next over is an RGB video port and standard stereo RCA jacks for audio. But let's talk about that RGB port. Uh, this is sort of an oddball port. I mean, it looks very much like the same kind of RGBI port you'd find on a Commodore 128 or on any IBM CGA compatible computer. However, it's not wired the same. Uh, this is an analog RGB output and thus electrically, it's more like what you'd find on the Amiga or an Apple IIGS. Exactly why they chose this design, I really have no idea. So at this point, I thought it was time to connect up a monitor so I could power this thing on. I figured I'd start with my Commodore 1084 and just run with the standard separated Chroma Luma connection since I don't have a proper RGB cable. Well, I powered it on and it does work, but it appeared in black and white. So my first thought was this computer must not support the separate Chroma Luma style video signal. I suspected I could fall back to composite video if need be, but I also realized it might be pretty quick and easy to connect it to my RGB modded television, so I made a little custom cable like so. And I was able to hack this together in just a few minutes. Well, unfortunately it didn't quite work. I got a picture and it was in color, but it was rolling. So I figured there must be something different in how the sync signals work. Of course, I was totally wrong about all of this. Uh, it was actually something far more fundamentally wrong, and I should have picked up on it sooner. But the way I figured it out was when I started trying to record video, even the black and white video from the 1084 monitor. It looked good in person, but my camera would not sync with the picture on the screen. And then it hit me exactly what was wrong. Uh, the lack of color, the wrong frame rate, this unit was outputting PAL video, and I'm trying to use NTSC monitors. So, um, as you can see, once I adjusted my camera to 25 frames per second, it looks rock solid, albeit in black and white. Now, fortunately, the Commodore 1084 is very happy to display 25 frames per second, but my North American version still won't decode a PAL color signal. Now, my, my poor Samsung TV is not at all happy with 25 frames per second. It just goes bonkers. So after doing a bit of research, uh, one of the things I found out is most, if not all, of the C65 prototypes that are out there in the wild are all PAL units. <laughs> Apparently Bo Zimmerman neglected to tell me this, but uh, to be fair, he's been running this thing on an RGB monitor for years, so it probably just slipped his mind. So I realized the only way to get color and 25 frames per second was going to be to use my 1084 in RGB mode. So I hacked together this little temporary solution into an Amiga video cable, and sure enough, I powered it on and got color. And no surprise, uh, the picture is very sharp, uh, much like you'd expect from an Amiga running in RGB mode. And this is actually 80 column text you're looking at. And of course, I can't help the moire effect being produced by my camera, so you'll just have to take my word for it that the picture looks really nice. Okay, so now that I have it up and running, one of the problems is there's just not really a lot of software to show. Um, one problem is, is that one C65 isn't necessarily even compatible with another C65 because all of the prototypes out there have like these different ROM versions, and so certain demos only even work on certain ROM versions. I did find this one demo that um, did show off the 256 color graphics capabilities. Unfortunately, it's a picture of a topless woman. So I've kind of censored it out here a little bit for you because it's not normally the kind of thing that I would show on my channel, but it is quite literally the only demo that I could get to come up showing any kind of 256 color graphics. Well, I figured if there wasn't any software to show, then I could make my own. I remember that little kaleidoscope demo that I showed on multiple different computers as a comparison of basic speed? Well, I figured I could load in the Commodore 128 version of that on here, and it does load, and I can list the program. It won't run, of course, because the graphics commands have changed. It actually took me quite a while to figure out how the commands work. As you can see here, I have it almost working. But I eventually figured it out, and um, the thing is, I'm pretty disappointed. I mean, it looks like it's running about twice as fast as the Commodore 128 version, and I was really expecting it to be faster than that. I mean, after all, this computer is supposed to run at 3.5 megahertz. I mean, even if I jumper the Commander X16 down to 4 megahertz, which should be in the same ballpark, it's a night and day difference. So um, I'm going to chalk this up to most likely just a slow implementation of BASIC on this computer. Of course, it isn't like there isn't 
any software that runs on it. I mean, after all, it's supposed to be backwards compatible with the Commodore 64. In fact, you can use the familiar go64 command to put it into C64 mode. And there we go. I know it doesn't look it on camera, but it's sort of unnatural seeing the C64 boot screen so sharp and clear due to the RGB interface. It's almost like I'm looking at an emulator. Of course, this brings us back to the problem I mentioned earlier. Little to no C64 software exists on 3.5 inch disks. And even if I connect an external drive, most C64 software won't load from anything other than device 8. So this really limits what C64 software you'd be able to run, especially if this had been released in 1990 and they were expecting people to use their off-the-shelf C64 software. Now, fortunately, I can make my own disks, so um, I copied the C64 version of Petsky Robots over to a 3.5 inch floppy. And I know this will work because there's no copy protection on this game, and another reason I wanted to start with this game, besides to toot my own horn, is because if anything doesn't work or seems to be incompatible, I'll most likely be able to narrow down exactly what's wrong, and maybe even devise a workaround. So, here goes. Okay, well, it sort of works. The music sounds terrible, but after listening to it a bit, I think the filter caps on the SID chip may have gone bad. So, this may not be a compatibility thing. So, I started the game and disabled the game music, and interestingly enough, all of the sound effects sounded totally normal. In fact, everything from this point seemed perfectly normal for the game, so I'd say if it weren't for the SID music, it'd be a 100% success. So I used my 1581 to copy over some more games. Oh, and by the way, the internal drive reads the same format as the 1581. I guess I should have mentioned that earlier. Anyway, um, what I've copied over are a handful of cracked single file games. Now, these sort of files shouldn't pose any problem for the disk format or the drive number. Oh, but by the way, I discovered I could press F1 in order to switch to 40 column mode. Anyway, uh, switching over to C64 mode, the first game I tried was Gianna Sisters, and behold, it works. <laughs> and I mean, it works pretty much perfectly. Uh, even the sound was mostly clear. The next game I tried was Panther. I did need to turn off the turbo load in the loader menu, though. Uh, this game played almost correctly. Uh, there seemed to be some sort of glitch with the bottom info panel. But I also realize there's a possibility this game is meant for NTSC, and maybe because I'm running on a PAL system, this could simply be a result of that. I don't have an easy way to tell, so it may or may not be the C65's fault. Next, I tried Qbert, and it seemed to work perfectly. No complaints there. Then I tried Ghosts and Goblins. This also seemed to work mostly. Um, there's a slight glitch on the text area at the bottom, much like Panther. So again, it could be a PAL NTSC thing. And um, the last of these games, I tried Spy Hunter. Again, kind of the same glitch at the split screen area, but other than that, seemed to work fine. Okay, so I wanted to try one more experiment. A few years back, Megravalp created Ultima 4 Gold, which is cracked and fits the whole game on a 1581 disc. So I gave it a try. Unfortunately, it does get stuck at this screen here. So then I thought, eh, let's plug in the real 1581 drive and configure it as device 10 and see if it works. And unfortunately, no, it doesn't. But it was worth a try. So yeah, I think the C64 compatibility is not nearly as bad as what I thought it was based on some stuff that I had read in the past. And I think the majority of the problem is the disk drive situation. Now it is possible had the machine come out and been successful that software companies would of course created special versions of their C64 games that would have been on a 1581 or C65 compatible 3.5 inch disc. But, um, you know, who knows? So the next thing we need to do is take this thing apart so we can have a look at the inside and see what we might learn. Here's the serial number, number 47. So if you ever see this up on eBay, chances are somebody robbed a Bose Commodore Museum. <laughs> I think it's really odd that a prototype unit would have a warranty seal on it in the first place, but uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, it appears that this is the only screw you need to remove to take this apart. There's just two snaps over here you have to move. And it just occurred to me, I should probably take out the RAM expander. It's a trapdoor system, just like the Amiga 500. There might be a screw or something under here, so better safe than sorry. And it just slides right out, just like the Amiga. And uh, so this is an official C65 RAM expander. If my math is right, I think this is adding one megabyte of RAM. I should mention that on PowerUp, it's saying no expansion RAM found, but Bo tells me this is due to an incompatible ROM version. Okay, let's take this top cover off. It appears the keyboard is connected with a ribbon cable, so I'll need to carefully remove that. At least this one has an unlock, so it's zero insertion force. 
And now the RF shield will need to come off. And uh, I'm just going to lay it to the side so I don't have to unplug that disk drive cable, which does not appear to have an unlock feature. Okay, so here's the motherboard. Um, it really doesn't resemble any motherboard from the 8-bit era. And I guess this is technically a 16-bit computer, so that makes sense. Here are those two SID chips, and I suspect one of the nearby caps may be bad, but uh, there's nothing obvious. One interesting thing I want to point out is that the board is called the C64DX, and I've seen some other documentation referring to it as such. I guess they changed the name to C65 at the last minute. Anyway, here's the onboard 128K of RAM. This is the 4510 CPU, which is a 16-bit CPU that's backwards compatible with the 6502 series and runs at 3.5 MHz. This should be every bit as fast, if not faster, than the 7 MHz 68000 chip found in the Amiga due to the different way uh, which 6502 chips work. And here's the 4567 video chip, uh, otherwise known as the VIC-3. Uh, this chip, while it works differently, is comparable in features to what's found in the Amiga. And believe it or not, this chip here is a DMA controller and blitter. Again, adding more Amiga-like capabilities. And here we have dual SID chips, which is a nice touch. That would give us six voices and stereo. And here's our 128K of ROM. And finally, the floppy drive controller. I think this could have been a really great system had it come out a few years earlier, maybe instead of the Amiga. Uh, but the problem is the, the comparison that one engineer made to the Plus 4 is not necessarily wrong because what you have here is a computer that's almost as good as the Amiga, maybe even better in certain aspects. And, um, and yet it's not compatible with the Amiga. Now, granted, the price would have played a big role in that. For example, if the machine had come out at like half the price of an Amiga 500, well, then I think it would have been a success. But also the more I think about it, the C64 compatibility aspect of this machine is somewhat of a double-edged sword, especially because it doesn't work 100% correctly and with the disk drive situation and all that. So I think what would have happened is it would have probably led to a lot of really bad reviews in the press because they would have gotten the machine, tried their C64 software and realized that they couldn't run it, even if the machine technically could. And so that also raises the question of how well would the software market have supported the native C65 capabilities? Well, if the computer had been released a couple of years earlier, then it would probably have seen similar support to the Apple II GS. But I think by 1990, it was becoming obvious that the world of IBM clones was where all the software support was going. So maybe that had some effect on the decision to can this product. So what about the Mega 65? I'm sure people are going to ask about it. Well, I don't know a lot about the system. I've been promised several times over the years that they would send me a unit to review, but I never got one. But from what I can tell, the Mega 65 does look a lot like the Commodore 65 prototype, and it is somewhat based on the C65 operating system. But uh, ultimately, the Mega 65 is a lot more powerful. And one of the things that Bo Zimmerman told me is how disappointed he was that all of the Mega 65 specific games that have come out won't actually run on a real C65. So unfortunately, for the various owners of these rare machines, about the only software they'll ever be able to run will probably be C64 stuff in C64 mode. Well, guys, that's it for this episode. As always, thanks for watching.